teach you a new song this morning. It's all about trusting in the promises of God. It's easy to catch on with, so go ahead and sing with us whenever you're ready. trust that your promises 
Jesus, don't fail. And it's easy to do in the good times, but God, we need you. In the bad times, no matter what we're Thank you.
Again, welcome to Mount Pleasant. We're glad that you're with us. If this is your first time for your guest, one of the things that we do here every week as a, a continuing act of our worship is by taking communion together. That's where we remember uh, Jesus' sacrifice on the cross and we celebrate the new life that we have in him. Um, in John chapters 13 through 16, we see that Jesus is preparing his disciples for the next big step in following him. They had left their family strayed, they left their parents' house, and they spent years listening to their rabbi speak, and they were astonished by his authority over weather, over diseases, and even over demons. But what came next shook them in their faith. They witnessed the heartbreaking evil of this sinful world that Jesus came to face and conquer. And to help prepare his disciples, Jesus spoke these words to them in John 14. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. We just sang this song, I Will Look Up, a song where we've declared our dependence on God, a song where we said, God, we're gonna look up to you. We're gonna bow before you. We're gonna look back and see where you've been faithful. And with trust and faith, we're gonna look forward to see what you're gonna do in the future. It's a song of remembrance, a song of trust that Jesus is truly the Lord of all things. So before we eat this bread and we drink this juice, I want you to say a few things to yourself. One, I trust in Jesus, that Jesus is God. Two, I trust that Jesus became a man. Three, I trust Jesus died for our sins. Four, I trust Jesus rose from the dead. And five, I trust Jesus is coming again. The bread, it's a reminder of Jesus' human body that was offered up for our forgiveness. And the cup of juice is this reminder that Jesus' blood was poured out to wash us clean from sin. So eat and drink and trust. Would you pray with me? God, we come before you today um, hopeful, willing, God, trusting in you. God, we're thankful for this time where we get to gather, God, where we get to spend a few moments, God, remembering God, your greatest act of love towards us by sending your son Jesus down to live this perfect life, to die on the cross for our, for, our, for our sins so that we might have this perfect relationship with you. God, so in this moment, God, may we just remember that. God, may we remember the love that you have for us. God, and may we celebrate the new life that's been offered to us. God, we're thankful for this moment, God. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. We're gonna continue in our time of worship through the giving of our tithes and our offerings. We do this every single week. Again, we're thankful for your partnership with us. It allows us to make this undeniable impact for Christ here and around the world. Um, if you're prepared to give today, you can give by uh, leaving. Uh, there's boxes attached to the walls. You can drop your, your gift in there or you can give online, it's super easy. You can go to our website, npcc.info, click on the give tab. It'll walk you through all the different ways that you can give. Uh, we also take this time to talk about our Change for a Dollar initiative. It's where we challenge every single person here and all of our services every weekend to give $1. And then we take that money and we immediately give it away to a person or to a family in need. Let me share a little bit about uh, the Letterly family uh, and this week's Change for a Dollar story. 
Um, in mid-May, Kristen's father, Mike, uh, was taken to the emergency room uh, for some trouble uh, with his breathing. After many tests, Mike was given um, an unexpected diagnosis of stage four carcinoma cancer. Um, Mike has been having some chemotherapy treatments um, and is tolerating them reasonably well. However, they're told that treatment was gonna be very limited at this stage. Um, Kristen and her mom, Tammy, they share in Mike's care as well as um, the financial responsibilities. So change for a dollar funds are gonna be used um, to help relieve some of this immediate stress of the financial struggles. Um, and pay for some current household and medical bills. Would you pray with me for our offering and for Mike? God, we're thankful for the way that you love us, God. God, and so in response to that great love, the mercy that you have for us, God, the, the blessings and generosity that you pour out on us, God, in response to that, we give back to you, God, out of obedience, God, and out of love um, for your people. God, we ask that you would God, just stir in us this desire to, to give back as a way to love your people. God, may we use these gifts to continue, continue the work here that we're doing, um, God, but also for, for Mike, God, and his family. Um, God, we just ask that you relieve uh, some of this stress. God, that these funds, these gifts would be a way um, to show love for them. God, that they would... Um, be able to turn um, to one another, that they would be able to spend this time together without the stress of all these different um, things weighing on them. God, we know this is tough. We know this is a hard season for them. Um, God, so just surround them with people that would love on them and walk alongside them through this. God, we're thankful and we praise in Jesus' name, amen. Let's celebrate the opportunity to give. And like we say all the time, uh, your partnership with us is allowing us to make this impact, not only here, but around the world. Uh, so we want to show you this video that shows exactly how your generosity is making that impact. I want to ask you a question this morning. Can a single church in central Indiana change the world? I think the answer is yes. I, I really do. I believe it can. Hey, good morning, church family. Great to see all of you. Good to be back in the pulpit after being gone for a couple of weeks on vacation. I want to welcome all of you, especially if you're a guest. Thanks for being here if you're a guest. We love to welcome guests into our services. If you've got a Bible with you, let me see you grab that Bible and let me hear your pages turning to Psalm 37. Go to the book of Psalms, find Psalm 37, and let me hear your pages turning there. And just hold that ready. This is uh, the third week of a special message series 
called Summer in the Psalms, and we're focusing our attention primarily on psalms that express real genuine emotion related to the struggles in our lives because God can handle whatever it is that we're feeling in our lives. Now, I got to tell you that I listened to the first two messages of this series. The first one was delivered by our children's pastor, Chris Franklin, and then la the last one was delivered by my son, Andrew, who's our group's pastor. And I just thought, I hope you were here because I thought both of those were just really, really tremendous messages. And they challenged me, uh, and they, they blessed me, and they gave us a really good, thorough biblical explanation for how to deal with some of the emotions that we can sometimes feel in our lives. And so if you haven't listened to those, I pray that you'll go to the website and do that real soon. And let's just, let's just thank God again. Uh, we don't have to clap or anything, but just for the, the, the blessing that he has placed on our church that's allowed us to be so generous with mission partners. And I really continue to believe uh, with all my heart that a single church in central Indiana can change the world. I believe that. I do. Uh, I celebrated a birthday while I was gone over the last couple of weeks, and every year when I celebrate a birthday, I'm reminded of something that, was, uh, that I think God placed on my heart when I was a very young man. Uh, it's like a prayer to me. It becomes more dear to me with every passing year, and that is just this simple thought, God, please don't let me live a small life. That's something that's important to me. Don't let me live a small life. I don't want to live a small life. And I don't have that prayer because I think that I'm somehow something special because I know that I'm not. I know better than anybody that I'm not. But after being a Christian for over 50 years and serving in the local church for more than 40 years, I know that when my life is joined together with the lives of thousands of other committed believers and together we're committed to serving God and, and living like Jesus and being generous, then we can do incredible things. And I continue to believe with all my heart that a single church in central Indiana can change the world. Somebody say amen to that. And I appreciate so much your generosity and your participation in that. Well, as we continue this Summer in the Psalm series, I'm going to talk to you about something that I don't think I've ever really talked about before. I'm going to talk to you about the emotions of jealousy and envy. And I'm going to link those two together because they are very similar for two reasons. First, they both can create negative feelings toward other people in our lives. And second, they can both have a negative impact on our lives. Now, having said that, I will tell you that I do understand that there is a difference between jealousy and envy. In fact, this is the way I would describe that difference. First, with jealousy, jealousy is when you feel resentment towards someone who has some quality or advantage you don't have or who has experienced some level of success that you haven't experienced. That creates jealousy in our lives. Envy, on the other hand, is when you feel discontent with your own life in comparison to someone who, again, has some quality or advantage you don't have or has experienced some level of success that you haven't experienced. And from a purely personal standpoint, I really believe that when you put the two side by side, that jealousy is worse. That's not to say that envy is not something that is negative or bad or can have a negative impact on our life. But I think jealousy is worse because jealousy is an emotion that can cause you to feel resentment toward other people. And sadly, sometimes that resentment can turn into hostility. And so there's a big danger there. But here's the biggest problem when it comes to discerning the difference between jealousy and envy. And here's why I'm linking the two of them together in this message today. Most people don't take the time to distinguish between the two. And here's what I mean by that. If someone were to ask you, or if I were to ask you rather, to describe for me a time when you felt jealousy, chances are most of the time you would tell me about a time when you felt envious of someone. Even though jealousy and envy are two different things, we don't often distinguish the two in our lives. So I'm going to talk about both of them together from the perspective of the Scriptures because both of them have the power to create huge problems in our lives because God doesn't want us to be held captive by jealousy or envy or any other thing like that. And that brings us to Psalm 37. So if you got your Bibles open there and you're able today, go ahead and stand with me for the reading of the Scripture. Again, if you're a guest, thanks for being here. It might seem odd that we're standing once again when you just got the chance to sit down. But uh, here's the deal. Uh, we make the public reading of Scripture a part of every service uh, when we gather together. Why doesn't every church? That's a question we can talk about some other time. We make the public reading of Scripture a part of every service, and because we love and respect God's Word, we stand together when we read. So I'm going to read Psalm 37, beginning in verse 1. I'm going to stop at the very first part of verse 7. You follow along as I read. 
David is writing, he says, do not fret because of evil men or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. All right, there it is. You can be seated. And we always ask that God would bless the reading and the hearing of his word. I've got a really simple two-point outline for my message today. I'm going to talk to you, number one, about the danger. Of course, I'm talking about the danger of jealousy and envy. And then I'm going to talk to you, number two, about the deliverance that God offers for jealousy and envy. And uh, we're going to revisit Psalm 37 and those seven verses when we get to that second point and we talk about the deliverance. But we're going to begin with the danger. And while I could give you lots and lots of different kinds of danger that is associated with jealousy and envy, time only allows me to share four of them with you. And so you might want to write these down. Here's the first danger uh, that I want to share with you related to jealousy and envy. Number one, jealousy and envy damage our self-esteem. Jealousy and envy damage our self-esteem. Psychology Today magazine once conducted a survey of 25,000 people and found that jealousy and envy are one of the root causes of poor self-esteem, which is something that plagues so many people today. And the reason why is because we spend so much of our time comparing ourselves with others with other people. And one of the results of that preoccupation with comparison is we end up losing sight of who we are. And the Bible tells us that each one of us is fearfully and wonderfully made by God. Somebody say amen to that. In fact, look at these verses on the screen from Psalm 139 verses 13 through 16. These were also words that were written by David. He said, as he talked about God, for you, God created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you. Here it is because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Now, if we stop right there, there are so many things we could talk about related to those verses because they are just incredible. They speak to so many different realities of life and living. But let me just summarize in the context of this message what David is saying to us here with this statement. When God made you, God made you with you in mind. God made you with you in mind. You don't need to look around and compare yourself to anyone else because you were made by God to be exactly who you are. Think of it like this. When God made you, he knew who you would be, and he was okay with that because you were exactly who he wanted you to be. Now, I know that sounds so silly and simple in some ways, but I hope you can appreciate the point that I'm trying to make. We don't need to waste our time comparing ourselves with others because each one of us were fearfully and wonderfully made by God to be exactly who we are in every way, shape, or form. Rick Warren in his book, The Purpose Driven Life, says it like this. Long before you were conceived by your parents, you were conceived in the mind of God. And our sovereign God, our sovereign God made you exactly the way you are. And so the question we have to ask ourselves, all of us, is do I believe that's really true? Do I believe that our sovereign God, and when I mean our sovereign God, I mean our God who is in control of all things, our God who makes no mistakes, do I believe that he created me to be exactly the way he wanted me to be? Do I believe that our sovereign God created me with all of my strengths, with all of my weaknesses, with all of my advantages, with all of my shortcomings, with all of my fine points, and with all of my flaws, because that's who God wanted me to be? That's what we have to ask ourselves. Do I believe that's true? Because that will help us when it comes to this comparison game that so many of us play as we go through life. When Gladys Allward was a young girl, she hated her straight black hair and she hated the fact that she was short. 
and she wondered every single day of her life why she couldn't be blonde-headed and tall like all the other girls in her class. Now, let me ask you a question. You think all the other girls in her class were tall and blonde-headed? No. But this is what jealousy and comparison and, and, and envy and comparing ourselves with others does. It creates a, an irrational thought process in our lives. As far as she was concerned, everyone else was tall, everyone else was blonde, everyone else was beautiful, and she was short and she had dark straight hair and she hated that. She wondered every day why God made her that way. But when she became an adult, she began to understand God's plan for her life because here was the unique thing about her. God called her to be a missionary in China during a time when Westerners weren't welcome in China. And once she became a missionary in China, she realized that it was her dark hair and her small frame that helped her blend in with the people she served, making her seem less like an outsider opening up more doors of opportunity for her to reach people. Some of you would be familiar with the name Amy Carmichael. When she was a child, she used to pray that God would turn her brown eyes blue. She thought blue, was, blue eyes were much more beautiful than brown eyes. Her brother had blue eyes, and she was jealous of him. But later in life, when she was called to be a missionary, now not to China but to India, she understood why God gave her brown eyes because they helped her blend in with the people she served. And if you know anything about the life and ministry of Amy Carmichael, you know that she spent a large part of her ministry saving children from temple slavery, and her brown eyes helped protect her anonymity as her face was covered with a scarf, and all you could see were her eyes. Her brown eyes helped her, protected her from people who would discourage and stop what she was trying to do. We spend far too much time in our lives asking questions like, God, why did you create me like this? Or God, why, why did you give me this family? Why did you put me in this crazy family? Or God, why did you give me these limitations that I have? And the answer to all those questions is the same for all of us. God created us exactly the way we are with the family we have and the limitations we have because, because God has a plan for our lives and his plan for our lives is something that only we can do. God has a plan for your life that is only something that you can do. And that's why he created you exactly the way you are. But when our lives become consumed with jealousy and envy... We never give ourselves the opportunity to discover how unique we are <clears throat> or that we were uniquely created to be who God wanted us to be and to do what God wants us to do. Look at these words on the screen from Acts chapter 17, verse 26. Some of you who went with me to Greece and Turkey in 2016 will remember that while we were in the city of Athens, we visited a place called the Areopagus, which was a giant rock outcropping there in the city. Uh, it later became called Mars Hill, but it was a place where the wise men and the philosophers would gather and, and talk and discuss things and debate things. And when the Apostle Paul, Acts 17 tells us when Paul traveled to Athens, he was overwhelmed and discouraged by so much idolatry in the city, and so he began to preach boldly the message of Christ, and he ended up on the Areopagus one day, this rock outcropping, where he addressed the council of Areopagus. So at one time, Areopagus was both a place and a group of people, and this is one of the things he said to them about God. From one man, he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. Now, you know what that reminds us of? That God is a sovereign God. And nothing happens, nothing, happens, nothing happens by accident. He's in control of all things, including every detail of your life. And this is the God that we need to trust. This is the God that we need to believe in. Our sovereign God is con in control of all things. And so don't let jealousy and envy distract you from that truth and the uniqueness of your life and the unique call God has on your life. Here's the second danger. Jealousy and envy create a lack of contentment. Jealousy and envy create a lack of contentment. Let me give you an important truth about contentment that we learn from the Bible. We learn it from the Apostle Paul in Philippians, in the letter of Philippians. We learn that contentment isn't something that just happens to us automatically. It's something we learn. Contentment isn't something that happens to us automatically. It's something we learn. That's what Paul teaches us in Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. Uh, listen to these words. You can see them on the screen. Paul writes and says, I am not saying this because I am in need. Remember, when Paul wrote the letter of Philippians, he was in prison. He was in jail. This is one of his prison epistles. 
And so from prison, from jail, he wrote these words. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned. Everyone say learned. Learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned, everyone say learned again, learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do everything through him. He's talking about Jesus now. Through him who gives me strength. Now, what Paul is saying here is that Contentment is not something that just happens to us automatically. It's something we learn. And when Paul talks about contentment here in those verses, we need to make sure we don't make the mistake of thinking that Paul is talking about complacency because contentment is something completely different from complacency. Contentment is being happy and being at peace wherever you are with whatever your circumstance or your situation is. And Paul had learned to be content regardless of the circumstances. But that doesn't mean, listen to me close, because we need to understand he's not talking about complacency. That doesn't mean, just because Paul had learned to be content regardless of the circumstances, that doesn't mean that Paul wouldn't have changed some of those circumstances had he been given the chance, because being content is not the same as being complacent. Being complacent means you think nothing can be changed about your circumstances or your life. Being complacent means that you think that you're stuck in whatever situation you're in. But that's not the attitude Paul had. That's different from being content. And here's how I know for sure that that's not the attitude that Paul had. I'm going to go back to a little bit of an earlier place in Philippians. I'm going to go back to Philippians chapter 1 now. Those verses we read were Philippians chapter 4 verses 11 through 13. If I turn back in my Bible to Philippians chapter 1 and I read verses 20 through 26, this is what I see Paul writing. He writes and says, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Remember, he was in prison. He didn't know whether he was going to live or die. He didn't know what the next day was going to hold. Then he goes on to say, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now note this. He says, if I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. And then he says, convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith so that my being with you again, excuse me, my being with you again, so that through my being with you, again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Now, let me tell you what we just read. Paul was content, even being in jail, not knowing what the next day would bring, but he wasn't complacent because he was thinking about the future. He was thinking about what might happen next. He could possibly die and go to be with the Lord, and that's a big celebration. Or he could stay and continue to serve the Lord, which is what he ended up believing was going to happen, and that's exactly what happened. Contentment is not the same thing as complacency. We need to learn to be content. But that will never happen if we live our lives overwhelmed with jealousy and envy because a person overwhelmed with jealousy and envy will never be content with where they are and what their circumstance is in life. Here's the third danger. And this is a big one, and this hits all of us right where we live. Jealousy and envy keep us from enjoying the success of others. Jealousy and envy keep us from enjoying the success of others. If you're jealous and envious of someone, you'll never celebrate their success. And friends, there's no better example of that in all the world than one that we find in the Bible in the Old Testament. And that's the example of King Saul, who was jealous of a shepherd boy named David. I'm sure that many of you remember that story. Saul was a decorated military hero. He was the ruler of the nation of Israel. He was an incredibly accomplished man, but his entire life changed because of the jealousy and the envy he felt toward David, who was nothing more than a shepherd boy when he first met him, even though Saul himself was an incredibly accomplished man. And see, because see, one of the big problems with jealousy and envy is that they, again, are irrational emotions. They make no sense. With all that Saul was and all that Saul had, He couldn't help but be overwhelmed with jealousy and envy about a shepherd boy. Now, why did Saul feel the way that he did about David? Was it because of David's musical abilities? I mean, the Bible says that David played the harp and that he sang. There's no indication in the scriptures that that was the case. Was it because David was handsome? The Bible says literally that David was ruddy and handsome. Ruddy, I think, is a word that means red-complected. 
And that makes sense because what did David spend his life doing? It was a shepherd boy outside watching over sheep, right? He had a killer tan. <laughs> so he was tanned and he was handsome. The Bible doesn't give us any indication that that was Saul's problem. In fact, the Bible says about Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 9 and verse 2, he's, this verse begins by talking about Saul's father. It said, he had a son named Saul. Now listen to what it says about Saul. An impressive young man without equal among the Israelites, a head taller than any of the others. So there's no reason to believe that it was because David was so handsome. Why was he so jealous? Was it because he killed the giant Goliath? There's no indication in the scripture that says that's why he was jealous. In fact, the Bible tells us that Saul was so thrilled with what David had done when he killed the giant Goliath that he invited him to come and live in the palace and be a part of the royal family. No evidence of jealousy there. So why was Saul so jealous and envious of David? Well, look at these words on the screen. 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 7 and 9. Talking about some young women after one of the military battles in the city streets, as they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. Saul was very angry. This refrain galled him. They have, credited David, they have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? And note the last line, from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. Now, you know what? That passage shows us two things. First of all, it shows us, again, the danger, the great danger in jealousy and envy. But second, it shows us also one of the subtle differences between jealousy and envy. Because while envy is discontent with your own life or circumstance compared to what someone else has or who someone else is, jealousy is discontent with your own life or circumstance compared to someone else, and it's the fear of losing what you might have. You might, you might have a, a, a wealthy neighbor and he might come home one day with a brand new, incredibly expensive red convertible sports car and you don't feel any jealousy toward that, but then he offers to take your wife on a ride and she goes with him and you start to feel a little bit jealous. <laughs> there is a subtle difference between the two. And so... When somebody that we know has success in their life, we don't often celebrate that success because we're too filled with jealousy and envy. The fourth danger of jealousy and envy is that jealousy and envy lead to a denial of the goodness of God. And here's the bottom line, friends. Many people let jealousy and envy keep them from acknowledging and appreciating the goodness of God and all the goodness that he pours into our lives. Has that ever happened to you? Now, you might, your, first, your first thought might be, Pastor, that's never happened to me. I, 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 I'm thankful for the goodness of God. The goodness of God, that's my favorite song that we sing in church. I, that's never happened to me. Well, let me ask you this question. What's your first response when something good happens to someone you know? Is it genuine joy? Or is there a part of you that immediately thinks, why couldn't that have happened to me? See, here's the deal. Bible tells, the Bible tells us that God delights in giving good gifts to his children. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, and this is associated with what the Hebrew writer is teaching us about faith, the, the Hebrew writer says that, that God rewards those who earnestly seek him. He's a God who delights in giving good gifts. And so God chooses to do for people whatever he wants to do. He chooses what he wants for his purpose and his fulfillment and the fulfillment of his plan for all of us who, are, who belong to him. And, and sometimes that means that people get blessings in their lives and, and people get, some people get blessings that other people don't get. But we should never envy someone who is the recipient of God's goodness because God's good to all of us in different ways. And the truth is sometimes jealousy and envy leads us to deny that goodness. Now, there's a whole lot more I could say about the danger of, en of jealousy and envy, but I need to stop there so we can get to point number two and talk about how we are delivered from jealousy and envy. And so, if you'd like to take notes, write down next to number two, uh, these four things. I'm going to go back to Psalm 37. I'm going to go back to Psalm 37, verse 1 through 7, the very first part of 7. And I'm going to just tell you that in those verses, I'm gonna, I see four words, four words that 
put the, when we put them together, become the perfect formula to provide deliverance in our lives from jealousy and envy. And here's the first word. The first word is trust. Trust. And I go back to Psalm 37, verses 1 through 3. David said, do not fret because of evil men or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. And then he says, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. In other words, don't worry about anybody else and what's happening in their life. You trust in the Lord. When it comes to measuring our success against the success of others, we just need to trust God. That should be our, that should be our first thought. That should be our, the default mode for all of us is to just trust God. David said, do not fret because of evil men or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. How would you, how would you paraphrase those words? If you took those words and you put them in your own words, what would they sound like? This is what I wrote. Don't worry about what's going on in the lives of other people, especially people who do wrong. Just keep your focus on God. That's it. Gospel of John gives us a conversation that Jesus had one day with Peter after the resurrection. Jesus said something to Peter that was hard to hear. And it would have been hard to hear for anyone Basically, Jesus told Peter that he was going to end up dying the death of a martyr. Now, can we all agree that those would be words that would be hard to hear? And so Peter's first response upon hearing those words was to point his finger at John and say, well, what about him? And listen to how Jesus responded to Peter's question. This is John 21, verse 22. Jesus said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You follow me. Man, that is a great, great verse for all of us to take to heart. Stop worrying about other people and what, what does or doesn't happen to other people, what does or doesn't happen in your life. All you need to really worry about is following me because I got you. You believe God's got you? He's got a plan for your life. You just follow me. And that's a message to all of us who struggle with jealousy or envy, you know, because it, it creeps into our lives in so many different ways, so many subtle ways that sometimes we don't even recognize. Here's the second word. It's the word delight. If we pick up the text from Psalm 37, uh, where we left off, we're in verse 4, and uh, David says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Let me ask you a question. What is it that brings out jealousy or envy in you? Is it someone who has a newer or nicer thing than you, a bigger thing than you? Is it earn, earning more money? Is uh, somebody who earns more money than you? Is it somebody who gets more recognition than you or something like that? What is it that brings out jealousy and envy in you? Well, here's something we all need to think about from the perspective of being a follower of Christ. Oftentimes, the things, the things, and when I say things, I'm talking about worldly things. Oftentimes, the things that make us envious are things that really shouldn't be as important to us as they are because the Bible says that the priority of our lives as followers of Christ is to delight ourselves in the Lord, not in the things of the world. Now, having said that, I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not saying that success is wrong. Or that the pursuit of success, the, the pursuit of accomplishment in life is wrong because I don't believe that for a second. I, I, I'm, that's the way I'm wired. I'm not wired just to stay right here. I'm wired to try to keep moving forward in my life. And I'm sure many of you are exactly the same way. I'm not saying that living in a nice home is, is wrong or having a, a lot of money is wrong or, or anything like that. None of those things in and of themselves are wrong. What is wrong is when we put those things as the priority in our life. When, when our delight is first and foremost in those things and not in our Lord. That's when things get wrong. And so that's why we get this reminder here in Psalm 37, verse 4, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Isn't that a great verse? Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. What's that mean? Well, honestly, I think we can understand it a couple of ways. First of all, 
I think when you delight yourself in the Lord and he ends up as a result giving you the desires of your heart, that that means that when you delight yourself in the Lord, when he's your first priority and he's the first pursuit in your life, that he begins to create the desires that are in your heart. And he creates desires that are in line and in keeping with your pursuit of him. So that means he might replace those worldly desires with different desires. He might give you the desires of your heart. But there's a second way I think that we can interpret that as well. When you delight yourself in the Lord and he gives you the desires of your heart could mean that when you delight yourself in the Lord and you make the pursuit of the Lord your first and your highest priority, you put yourself in a position to be blessed. You put yourself in a position to receive a blessing. And we make the mistake sometimes, we've talked about this several times over the years, we make the mistake sometimes of, of thinking of a blessing only as a financial blessing because that's what some people falsely teach when it comes to stewardship of our finances and giving. And I, I think that when you, when you uh, delight yourself in the Lord, that you put yourself in a position of a blessing, but how that blessing can come, it can be a variety of, it can be a variety of different things. It can come in a variety of different ways. And as I've told you many times before, we should be mature enough to understand that there are greater blessings that God can pour in our lives than just a little bit more money in our pocket tomorrow. And so when you delight yourself in the Lord, you put yourself in a position to be blessed. The third word, is the word commit. We pick it up in Psalm 37, verses 5 and 6. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. This is one of my favorite passages in the Old Testament. Let me read it again. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. Let me give you a parallel verse from Psalm, Proverbs 16.3 that I think is, is saying pretty much the exact same thing. In fact, read this verse with me. Let me hear your voices. Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and your plans will succeed. So you commit your way, whatever you're doing, whatever you're, wherever you're going, whatever you're pursuing in your life, you commit your way to the Lord and you just continue to trust him. I know that I told you one time, I can't remember how long ago it was, that when I, got, when I first got out of college and I, I uh, began in ministry, I got fired from my very first church. I know some of you might probably remember that story. Some of you may have heard that, maybe have never heard that before, but I got fired from my first church. I was a youth pastor at a church in Houston, Texas, which, by the way, is where I met Katie Brown, who ultimately gave my name to the elders here to at the possibility of being uh, the, the pastor here when you were looking for a pastor 20 years ago. So there was a good thing that came from that. But let me tell you, I never really wanted to be a youth pastor. In my heart, I always just wanted to be a preacher. But I was 21 years old. I was single. And I didn't want to be a pastor of a rural church in southeast Kansas or someplace like that because I'd never lived in a small town. I, so I, I went to this church to be the youth pastor. And I was in charge of everything from the nursery all the way up through college, okay? And it was a troubled church. And I didn't realize how troubled it was until after I got there. The pastor had only been there for about three months. And a lot of people just didn't like the pastor, and the church was just struggling, and the attendance started going downhill, and the giving started going down, and everybody was unhappy, and there was grumbling and complaining. And in those days, we used to have board meetings once a month, and uh, it was made up of elders and deacons and staff members. <clears throat> and one night in a board meeting, there was a lot of fussing and fighting, and I'm just sitting there just praying to God that this thing would end sometime soon. And finally, one, one person said, I think we need to have a vote of confidence on the pastor. You ever been in a church where they did something like that? Well, let me tell you what that is. That's a recipe for a church split right there. And so they said, okay, we're going to have a vote of confidence on the pastor because that's what it says in the bylaws. And they set, scheduled a date down the road to have this vote of confidence. And the bylaws said that the pastor needed to receive two-thirds of vote of confidence in order to keep his job. And between that board meeting and the time of the vote of confidence, people came out of the woodworks. I mean, people came to church that hadn't been that church in years, you know. I don't know what it is about things like that that just draws people out from everywhere. And the day came for the vote of confidence, and it was taken, and the pastor did not receive two-thirds vote of confidence. 
But there were only two elders at the time because all the other elders had quit and left the church. And these guys were two elders who had never been elders before. And they stood up and they said, well, this is the result of the vote of confidence. But even though he didn't receive the two-thirds, we're going to keep him. (laughs) So before that happened, not long before that happened, the preacher, the pastor of the church, called me to come over to his house. And we sat down in the living room, and he was there, and his wife was there, and his daughter was there. Wife was crying. His daughter was crying. The lights were dimmed. I think they set me up really big time. (laughs) And he basically said to me, you need to be for me or you're against me. You're either for me or you're against me. That's what he said. Well, here's the deal, friends. I was just a youth pastor. I was just trying to do my job. I was just trying to do my job. That was it. And uh, for him, to be for him meant that I would separate myself from anybody who was against him. But my problem was I had in charge of responsibility of the nursery all the way through college. And almost everybody that worked on my ministry team, they weren't for him. <laughs> and so, I mean, I mean like, I'm like, holy cow, I, 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 don't, I must have missed this day in practical ministry class. And so, in the end, I just said, well, I don't think I can do that. Because if I did, I would lose all my volunteers, and I don't know what would happen next. And so, I left. And so, they had the vote. The elders stood up and said, this, 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 in this, despite the vote, we're going to keep him. The next Sunday, I came to church, and one of those elders met me at the door, and he said, turn in your key and clean out your office by the end of the day. And I got fired from my first church. Now... That was, okay, so that's 40 plus years ago, right? And I can talk about it today, and I'm okay for the most part. (laughs) And we can laugh about it. (laughs) But I was devastated at the time. And I had people from that church say things to me like, you've made a big mistake. You're never going to have another ministry opportunity. And just some really frightening things to somebody who was 21, 22 years old with no real experience to go on. And then I came across this passage. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn and the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. Do you think God can be trusted? He can. And that's why we commit our lives to this sovereign God who sees beyond the moment and can always be trusted. Here's the fourth word. The fourth word from Psalm 37, verses 1 through 7, is found in the very first part of verse 7, and that's the word wait. Because Psalm 37, verse 7, what I'll call verse 7a says, Be still before the Lord and wait. Everyone say wait. Wait patiently for him. Do you know that that is the best, the single best word, literally, of advice that you can hear If you're battling jealousy and envy, just wait. Wait on God. As you trust him, as you delight in him, and as you commit to him, be willing to wait on him. Be willing to wait on him. Because you know what? My whole life after that first church has been an incredibly blessed life. God gave me the opportunity to be the pastor of three different churches. One was a church plant. One was a turnaround church that was, had fallen on hard times, that experienced great growth and became strong and healthy. And the last 20 years with you here at Mount Pleasant. Wait. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Whatever it is that you think in your life is not right or is not enough or is not good, good enough or or doesn't measure up to someone else or whatever it might be that stirs up these emotions of jealousy and envy, the best thing you can do is to trust and delight 
and to commit and to wait, to wait on this God that we delight in, on this God that we trust, on this God that we're committed to because he has your best interest at heart. So those are the words, trust, delight, commit, and wait. Would you say those with me out loud? Trust, delight, commit, and wait. We could all do well if we wrote down a little prayer that we said during the day multiple times that just said something like this, Lord, when it comes to the danger of jealousy and envy, I will trust you, I will delight in you, I will commit my way to you, and I will wait on you. In Jesus' name, amen. Pray with me. Thank you, Lord, for this time to open up the Bible and share together in the truth of your word. And I pray that you would help us to take these truths to heart in a way that impacts our lives, changes our lives, and directs our lives. Thank you for being a sovereign God who can be trusted. We may not always understand how you choose to exercise your sovereignty in the world. There will be times when we have questions about why things happened or why things didn't happen. But we're limited, you're unlimited. And we, are, we don't exist on the same plane that you exist. We don't have the infinite capacities that you have. And so in those moments, we trust, we delight, we commit, and we wait. Help us to do that. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing one final song before we're dismissed. If you're a prayer counselor, uh, would you come on down as we sing this song uh, this morning? And if you're here today and you just got a burden in your life, it may not have anything to do with jealousy or envy. Maybe you're struggling with trying to understand God's plan for your life or your family or someone that you know and love. Maybe you've just got uh, someone on your heart something heavy on your heart, what, a, what better opportunity could you have this entire week than to come and let someone just pray with you, pray for you. Whatever the need might be, don't be self-conscious. Just come as we sing. When this life has overwhelmed me, I feel like giving up. I will cling to all you promised. It will always be enough. When the world around me crumbles, and it's hard to understand.
alongside us as we walk through times where we might be feeling jealousy or envy or just disappointment. We love you so much and we thank you for that. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. 